Today's video will be an irregular one, about the phantom time hypothesis, an alternative historical theory. In the last year, I've seen two debunking videos on major historical YouTube channels that in my opinion were quite superficial and kind of cheap. I'm referring to the videos of Metatron and Kings and Generals channels. Neither seemed to make an effort to properly investigate the subject. These videos have inspired me to begin this multi-part series, in which I will attempt to explain and argue in favor of the theory. So what is the phantom time hypothesis? German amateur historian Herbert Illig developed the theory which was published in 1991. Illig's theory proposes that there's a flaw in the current historical timeline, and that someone added 297 years to place certain historical figures at the decisive year of 1000 AD. Illig precisely defines these years between 614 and 911 AD. According to Illig, this period is fictitious, and removing the events of this period from the timeline would restore historical continuity. Illig also names those who he thinks are responsible in his book, Pope Sylvester II, Holy Roman Emperor Otto III, and Byzantine Emperor Constantine VII. In support of his theory, Illig cited arguments such as the lack of coins of the Frankish Empire, the anachronistic architecture of the Aiken Chapel attributed to Charlemagne, the nonsensical and incomplete history of the period, the quantity of proven forged Holy Roman documents of the era, the iconoclast movement in Byzantium, the mysterious disappearance of the Avar people and empire without a trace, as well as the introduction of the flawed yet still functional calendar reforms of Pope Gregory. At the time, the theory caused quite a stir in Hungary, for reasons that will be discussed in a later video. This is why computer scientist Gaiula Toth began to research the topic and developed his own theory. According to him, the dating system we use today does not count the years from Christ's birth, but was falsely claimed to be later. And as a result of this, we ended up with 500 fictitious years on our timeline, from the end of the 2nd century to the beginning of the 9th century. Because of the various chronological systems used in antiquity, this time period is full of parallel events. That's his theory in short. But how is this possible? Officially, the Christ era was invented in 532 by a monk called Dionysus Exegus, but it was not widely used until around the year 1000. Until then, Europe had several different chronological systems in use, all of which were inherited from antiquity. The Julian calendar was one such system, and when Julius Caesar reformed the Roman calendar in 45 BC, he also started a new era. Because there is no year zero on the timeline, the same event recorded by using the Julian calendar would have a 44-year difference compared to that of the Christ era. I'll give you a few more tabular examples of different chronological systems. The name of the chronologic system is shown on the left, and the time difference between that chronology and the chronology based on the Christian calendar is shown on the right. The Romans counted the years from the founding of Rome since 753 BC. The Greeks have counted years since the first Olympian game since 776 BC. There was a time counting system which counted the years from the death of Alexander the Great since 324 BC. The Seleucid chronology started when Seleucus the Nicator became the king of Persia in 312 BC. To this day, the dating used by the Coptic Christians of Egypt produces dates 283 years less than what we use. The difference between the dates of these various chronological systems is not always obvious. For example, the years of the Shaka system of time, which is still in use in India, are 78 or 79 years different from the Christian calendar, depending on the part of the year we are in, because the new year begins at a different time. Furthermore, because the concept of zero was introduced relatively late in European civilization, in the Middle Ages it was not always clear whether the first was the year Christ was born in or the year after. Such conversions between different eras can result in a one to two years additional difference. According to Gaiula Toth, because of the additional time in the chronology, later historians interpreted numerous dates as Christ era which actually belonged to a different chronological system, resulting in a repetition of the same occurrences in the relevant period. Let's assume that two historians each write a history of the same event, but one uses the Christ era dating and the other the Julian era dating. A modern historian may erroneously believe that both sources should be interpreted according to the Christian calendar, 
because he might be unaware of this discrepancy. So the same event gets recorded twice on our timeline with 44 years difference. I bring you an example. Officially, Attila the Hun died in 453. Some historians claim he died in 454. Well, Alaric, the goth king who followed a very similar life path, died 44 or 43 years later in 410. Both served in Rome as young men, Attila as hostage, Alaric as mercenary. Both were elected as kings after they returned home. Both of their main quarters were in the Carpathian Basin. At first, they both waged war against the Eastern Roman Empire, which is eventually concluded by a peace treaty in which the Eastern Roman Empire has to appease both Attila and Alaric. Then, both marched against the Western Roman Empire. Alaric marched against Italy, and Attila marched against Gaul, across a frozen Rhine in the dead of winter. A Western Roman general known as Flavius Stilicho in the case of Alaric, and Flavius Aetius in the case of Attila confronts each of them. And yes, you see it, right? The person on the altar image is both attributed to Flavius Stilicho and Flavius Aetius, possibly because they are the same person. In both instances, the invaders suffered a questionable defeat and withdrew to the Carpathian Basin. At this juncture, however, I believe it's crucial to point out that although officially unrelated to Alaric, nearly the same events occurred 44 years before Attila's campaign in Western Europe. Wikipedia writes the following about the year 406. December 31st, 406. Vandals, Alans, and Swabians cross the Rhine in Magantiacum. Today, Mainz. Beginning the invasion of Gaul. And according to official history, 44 years later, exactly one Julian calendar difference later, in the winter of 450, Attila, at the head of his armies, crosses the frozen Rhine and enters Gaul. I bring up the Battle of the Catalonian Plains, which happened at the summer of 451, because there are a few other battles which I believe are the same event. The first is the Battle of Chalons, which took place in 274 BC, between two officially competing emperors, in a location close to where the Battle of Catalunum happened. It's interesting to note that the name of the Battle of Chalons was given to it by modern historians. Historical records simply call it the Battle of the Catalonian Plains. Wikipedia states that the fight made it difficult for Roman Emperor Aurelian to protect the Rhine, and a German army marched into Gaul by crossing the river that year. The following year, Aurelian managed to defeat them. In 359, an army of Alamanni crossed the Rhine and clashed with the Romans first at the Battle of Duroctermi, and later at the Battle of Burma, where the Romans defeated them. Nine years later, in 365, an army of Alamanni crossed the Rhine and clashed with the Romans in Gaul, where the Romans defeated them. In 366, at the beginning of the year, on the frozen Rhine, an army of Alamanni proceeds to cross the Rhine again. The Romans defeat the invaders, again. But you don't have to wait long for another Alamanni attack, because in 367, Alamanni's cross, you'll never guess where, the Rhine specifically the city of Mainz, exactly where the Vandal, Allen, and Swaby army crossed in 406. The Romans defeat them at the Battle of Salcinium. They did this three times, three years in a row, in order to be beaten by the Romans thrice. But it isn't long before another quote-unquote barbarian army crosses the Rhine and again invades Gaul, as it happens in 372, by an army of Sarmatians, Quades, and Alamanes, now I suppose you start to notice a pattern here. But back to Attila and Alaric. After their earlier campaign against the West was unsuccessful, they both marched against Italy, Alaric in 408 and Attila in 452. That's exactly 44 years, or one Julian calendar difference apart. Both of them reached Rome, and Roman envoys tried to negotiate with them at the walls of Rome, where they appear to have struck some form of agreement. Their story here differs slightly. Alaric attempts to establish himself as the Emperor of Rome, but the Romans reject this. While Attila returns to the Carpathian Basin, Alaric besieges Rome in 409 and then occupies it in 410. It's interesting to note that a Vandal army successfully besieges Rome in 455, 45 years or nearly a Julian calendar difference later. Attila and Alaric both passed away two years after they invaded Italy. 
44 to 43 years apart from each other. According to a legend, both were buried in the bed of a diverted river, which was then dug back up, and the slaves who buried them were killed so that no one would find their graves. Well, if Gaiulatoth is right, and I think he is, then the story of Alaric and Attila is about the same person. One is reported by German sources as Alaric, using Christian-era dates, while the other is reported by Latin sources as Attila, using Julian-era dates. By the way, a little thing that I noticed about Alaric when I was collecting the pictures for the video. Wikipedia gives two different years for the death of Alaric. The quote-unquote traditional year of Alaric's death is the beginning of 410. However, if we read his story, this event is stated to happen at 411. The reason for this is probably that Alaric occupied Rome in the spring or summer of 410. But Alaric cannot occupy Rome in 410 if he dies at the beginning of the year. Therefore, there are two possibilities. Either Alaric dies in 411, or he occupies Rome earlier, say, in 408, two years before his death, when he besieged Rome for the first time, just like Attila. Returning to the Siege of Rome, an interestingly named Gothic warlord by the name of Totila first emerges in the 6th century. In 550, Totila conquers the city of Rome. It's noteworthy to observe that Giovanni Villani, an Italian historian, wrote about Totila in his chronicle in the 1300s as if he were Attila. For instance, he refers to Totila as Flagellum Dei, the scourge of God. I'll give you a few more examples about similar events happening 44 years apart. In 220, the Goths attacked the Balkans. 45 years later, in 265, the Goths also attacked the Balkans. In 197, the Romans launch a war against the Persians. 45 years later, in 242, the Romans also launch a war against the Persians. In 257 and 258, the Roman Emperor issues several decrees banning Christianity and ordering persecution of Christians. In 303 and 304, 46 years later, the Roman Emperor issues several decrees banning Christianity and ordering persecution of Christians. In 299, a Persian-Roman War ends. 45 years later, in 344, a Persian-Roman War ends. And these are just a few examples of many. If you look closely at the history of this period, right up to the end of the Roman Empire, you'll find the same events repeated over and over again. A barbarian invasion of Gaul via the Rhine, or a revolt of Roman legions in Gaul led by a man from the British Isles. The emperor who confronts these is usually led by a man called Marcus Aurelius, or some variant of this name. Barbarian invasions of Italy, barbarian incursions into the Balkans, war with Persia, and persecution of Christians. Also, co-emperors of Rome are quite common in this period. So as you can see, the period in question is full of repeating similar events, most likely due to the insertion of non-existent centuries into the timeline, which led later historians to not recognize these events as the same due to necessity to fill up the quote-unquote empty time. I plan to make more videos on this subject, given of course that there's interest for it, this is intended as a sort of introduction and food for thought. There's a lot more to be said on the subject, and I intend to say it.